Hi, and welcome to Dr. V's AP Chemistry webcast. Today we're going to be talking about deviations from ideal gas behavior. And in order to do that, we do need to review kinetic theory so that we know what ideal gases do. Obviously, if we're talking about ideal gases, we want to talk about the ideal gas law, which we're all familiar with. We've done lots of calculations with it, PV equals nRT. Now this is derived from kinetic theory, and it allows us to predict and explain the macroscopic behavior of an ideal gas. So we need to talk about what we mean by an ideal gas. In order to do that, we need to revisit kinetic theory of gases, as I mentioned before. So kinetic theory has a few statements that define the whole theory. It says that gas particles are in constant random motion. So here's a simulation from the University of Texas, and you can see how the particles are moving around randomly. And we can play it again, and we can see that they're moving in straight lines, and they collide with each other, and they collide with the container walls. And when they do collide with the container walls, that's how they exert pressure on the container, because of those collisions. Another statement of the kinetic theory as it applies to gases is that the temperature of the gas is proportional to the average kinetic energy. So that means we're using a Kelvin temperature, and right now it's at 325 in our simulation. So let's run this, and as we heat it and the temperature goes up, look what happens with the kinetic energy in that top right hand corner. It increased dramatically. Another statement of kinetic theory is that the collisions are elastic. So what that means is that there's no net gain or loss of energy when the gas particles collide with each other or when they collide with the container walls. There are two more statements of kinetic theory, and what they do is simplify the math so we can really end up with the ideal gas law in the end. The first says that gas particles are dimensionless. They're points. They're geometric points and they have no dimensions. And their volumes are negligible compared to the container volume. We can just ignore their con the volume occupied by the gas particles themselves, says kinetic theory. And kinetic theory of gases also states that there are no attractions or repulsions between gas particles. So this is what we mean by an ideal gas, a gas that obeys all of these statements. And that all seems fine until we think about actual properties of molecules and atoms. We know that atoms have a volume, and therefore gas particles have a volume of their own, right? We have periodic trends, measurements of atomic radii, and therefore, if they have a radius, they have a volume. So they do have a volume. How can we just ignore this? And we also know that particles, molecules, and atoms are attracted to each other. We have dipole-dipole attractions with polar molecules. We have London forces for all of our all of our species. And so there are attractions even though they're weak. So if we ignore them, how well is this going to really predict the behavior of gases? All right, and so that's really what we're looking at in this webcast. How well does the ideal gas law predict the behavior of gases in the real world? So we're going to start by considering the volume occupied by the gas particles themselves. So that's what I have here in this particle level diagram. Let's pretend that I have one mole of neon atoms in this container. What we're assuming is that the gas particles are dimensionless. They don't occupy any volume. And so if I've got one mole of neon atoms in a 10.00 liter container, every single neon atom has full use of the full 10.00 liters. Absolutely, 100%. And yet we know that neon atoms have a radius, and therefore we can calculate a volume for neon atoms. So that's not really correct. Real volumes are occupied by gas molecules. They're tiny, but they are there. So if we were to take all of those neon atoms and squish them down, we can see that they are taking up some of the volume of the box. Now this is not to scale, but we're trying to get that idea of this excluded volume. In other words, they're taking up some of the volume of the container, and those 1.00 moles of neon atoms don't have full use of the 10 liters. They have a tiny fraction less than that. They might have use of 99.98% of the container, something like that, but it's not 100%. And so that is going to have an effect. In other words, the available volume for those neon atoms is smaller than the 10 liters that we said the volume of the container was. And therefore, since the volume's a little bit smaller, the pressure's going to go up. We're going to have more collisions with the container walls. And we're going to end up with a higher pressure than predicted by the ideal gas law because the particles themselves take up some of that volume. So this is sometimes referred to as the excluded volume. If we compress the container more, the deviations from ideal behavior become even more pronounced. So if we had one mole of neon atoms in a 10 liter container, there's a tiny amount of deviation. If we make the container smaller to five liters, now 
the molecules or the atoms, excuse me, of neon are occupying the same total volume, but it's a larger percentage of the container. So now maybe instead of having 99.98%, maybe it's 99.97%. I'm making those numbers up, but we're trying to get that idea across. And so as the container volume decreases, we see larger deviations from the ideal behavior. All right, the particles are more crowded together. They're taking up a larger percentage of the container space, and therefore we see a larger pressure than we would have predicted just from the ideal gas law. We also see that the volume of the particles themselves has an effect. Particles that are, have a larger volume are going to occupy a larger excluded volume. So if we look at gas A, which is the yellow, and the gas B particles, which are the smaller, we can see that gas A I'm trying to show has a larger particle volume than the gas B. Now again, these aren't to scale, but if the particles for gas A are bigger, they're going to occupy a larger fraction of that container, and therefore the molecules or the particles of gas A are going to have a smaller available volume, and therefore we're going to have larger deviations for gas A compared to gas B, all right? Because if we have the same number of moles and they're at the same temperature, right, the gas B molecules or particles have a little bit more room comparatively. Now, the other thing that comes up is that kinetic theory says there are no attractions or repulsions between particles, but we know that molecules and atoms do experience attractions to other molecules and atoms. That's true in the gas phase. It's very important for, obviously, our condensed phases of matter, but it does happen in the gas phase. So what will that do to our observed gas pressures? That's what I'm trying to show with the little dashed lines between the blue dots here. All right. If they're attracted to other particles, they're going to end up colliding with the container walls a little bit less frequently. It may not be a dramatic change, but it is a real change. And they're going to collide with less force because they're, they're sort of being attracted to other particles instead of being hitting the wall, right? So it kind of slows them down a little bit. And so we're going to end up with a lower pressure than predicted by the ideal gas law because of the attractions between the particles. Now we can well imagine that temperature is going to play an important role in this. If particles are going to overcome attractions, they need kinetic energy to do that. So the faster they're moving means more of them will have enough kinetic energy to overcome those attractions. So at higher temperatures, what we see is that the attractions become less important. So when should we expect gases to behave similarly to ideal behavior, what the ideal gas law would tell us? Well, one thing would be very small volumes for the particles themselves. So we see for hydrogen and helium gases that their behaviors are very close to ideal behavior at a very large range of conditions. Because the particles are so tiny, unless they're packed in really closely, they're not going to be occupying a very large percentage of the container. Conditions where the gas particles are really spread out and far away from each other, that also tends to give us closer to ideal behavior. Lots of space, the excluded volume occupied by the gas particles themselves is very small, and so we're going to see very, very close to ideal behavior under those conditions. We also see that at high temperature conditions, we also get behavior that's closer to what we would, would expect for an ideal gas. Because at high temperatures, many of the particles will have enough kinetic energy to overcome any attractions that they're experiencing and they're going to break away and so those attractions aren't going to really lead to fewer collisions at, with a lesser force because those attractions really just aren't affecting them that much because they're zipping around really fast so when the particles are moving quickly they're not spending much time near the other attract the other particles and therefore they're not really having much time to participate in any attraction even though it could potentially be happening Okay, so let's switch gears. When should we expect deviations from ideal behavior? Sometimes this is referred to as real behavior. What would give us these deviations? Well, one thing that would lead to this is polar molecules. Molecules that are strongly attracted to each other are very likely to collide less frequently with the container walls because they're attracted to each other. So the stronger the attractions, the more deviations we're going to see. We also see that when the temperatures are low, fewer particles have the kinetic energy to overcome attractions to the other particles, all right? And so they're going to be attracted. We're going to see fewer collisions with the container walls. They're going to hit the container walls with less force, and that's going to lead to deviations. 
Another thing that leads to deviations from ideal behavior are high pressure conditions. When the particles are packed in more closely, they're occupying a larger volume of the container itself because of their own volume. And they're going to be closer to each other because they're packed in. So they're going to be experiencing stronger intermolecular attractions. When those particles are packed in, you can't ignore their volume anymore. It's going to make an effect. It's going to have a difference. This leads us ultimately to the Van der Waals equation. Van der Waal was a Dutch physicist who studied gas behaviors, and he ended up modifying the ideal gas law to account for the excluded volume and the attractions between particles. Here it is in all its glory. You're like, whoa, what's going on here? So there's a correction for intermolecular attractions. There's a correction for the volume of the particles themselves. And that's the equation. We really need to know Van der Waals equation and deviations from ideal behavior in a conceptual way. Calculations with this equation are beyond the scope of AP Chem. You need to know what the correction factor is for the attractions for that particular gas. You need to know what the correction factor is for the volume of the, occupied by the gas particles for that particular gas in order to do these calculations. And so it ends up being very particular to each gas. And so I'll point out for AP Chemistry students, the Van der Waals equation is not on the formula sheet and you are not expected to do calculations with it. You could, but you don't need to. So let's summarize what we've talked about in this webcast. The volume occupied by the gas molecules themselves, that excluded volume, decreases the usable volume of the container. And the net effect of that is that we get higher pressures than the ideal gas law would predict. Attractions between the particles leads to fewer collisions with the container walls, and that leads to lower pressures than what we would expect from the ideal gas law. It's fewer collisions and colliding with less force. Gases behave most like ideal gases when the temperatures are high and the pressures are low. It's really important that you know that. And we're going to see the most significant deviations from ideal behavior, aka real behavior, when the temperatures are low and the pressure are high. You really need to know those last two bullet points. They get asked a lot. If you found this helpful, please subscribe to my channel. Leave a comment. I hope you found this helpful and we'll keep learning chemistry.